trachea is the outermost, uh, the outer layer of the bone. And then you have the skull bone or crania, cranial bone. Under that you have meninges and as I have mentioned meninges has three members. Outermost is called the dura matter, middle one is the arachnoid matter and innermost membrane is the ear matter. So three layers of meninges are present under the bone. And also know that the cerebrospinal fluid is located under the arachnoid matter. That means this is the dura matter, this is arachnoid matter, this is pia matter and this is the brain, okay, brain tissue. So dura is the outermost membrane, <coughs> arachnoid is the middle one and pia matter is the innermost. Now, the space under the arachnoid matter is called subarachnoid space. Sub means under the arachnoid matter and the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF is located in subarachnoid space. Okay? And this space under the dura matter is called subdural space, right? And Sometimes hematoma occurs, blood accumulates in this space. So we say subdural hematoma. Subdural hematoma. Accumulation of blood under the dura matter. Okay. Uh, so, pia matter is the innermost membrane of meninges or innermost layer of the meninges and then you have the brain tissue. So, pia matter is attached to the surface of the brain because this is the innermost one. Okay? And when you will do the dissection of the brain, you will try to find the pia matter. It is very thin and closely attached to the surface, difficult to separate. Okay? Among these three meninges, outermost one is the dura matter and it is the toughest and thickest one. So, outermost dura is the toughest and thickest one. So, those are the structures um, protect the brain. <coughs> Venticles of the brain. Inside the brain, you have fluid filled cavities, right? Those fluid filled cavities are called the ventricles. Now, <coughs> there are total four ventricles in the brain two lateral ventricles, one third ventricle, and one fourth ventricle. So, those are the names of the ventricles. Two lateral one third and one fourth and those verticals are connected to each other. So the fluid can go from one ventricle to another because they are connected to each other. So we will see the location of those verticals in the brain. Although the ventricles are inside the brain, you won't see from outside, but these pictures are showing the position of those ventricles inside the brain. If you look from the front, how the ventricles are positioned inside the brain, you see in the left picture, you are looking from the front. You see two lateral ventricles, one, two, one third ventricle, this one and one fourth ventricle here, yeah. this, this one. So also you see they are connected to each other. Lateral ventricles are connected to the third ventricle, 
by interventricular foramen. So these are interventricular foramen. Connect lateral to third. Third is connected to fourth by cerebral aqueduct. So this is the cerebral aqueduct. You need to know the name of these ventricles and their connections. Okay. Now, if the pressure of fluid in any of those ventricles increase, if the pressure increases, then fluid can go to another ventricle through those connections. So that's why those connections are very helpful because, you know, sometimes pressure can increase in one, so fluid will move from that one to another one to reduce the pressure. Now, Sometimes what can happen, it is a clinical condition, for example, if a tumor, brain tumor is formed here, that can press the cerebral aqueduct. If a tumor is formed here, that can press the interventricular foramen and can block those connections. And in that case, what will happen? fluid will start to accumulate but will not be able to get out. So, the ventricles will get big because of the accumulation of fluid. Make sense? And in infants, you know that in infants, the cranial bones are not yet fused, right? So, they are connected by members. You will see moves, right? From the skull. So, when it happens in infants, fluid accumulates inside the ventricles more and more, the brain gets big. Okay? And the head gets big because the cranial bones are not yet fused, they can expand. Make sense? So, the head gets bigger and that is called hydrocephalus. Accumulation of fluid in the cephalic part means the head part, you know that, right? So, hydro means water. So, water in the head, hydrocephalus. So, that can happen due to blockages of those connections. Okay? Hydro, hydro means water, cephalus. <coughs> Surfaces and functions of the cerebrospinal, sorry, sources and functions of the cerebrospinal fluid. If you see, inside the ventricle or the fluid filled cavities inside the brain, what you will see, for example, this is the lateral ventricle. On the roof or ceiling of the ventricle, you have capillary plexus. That is called choroid. Plexus. It is a capillary plexus formed by capillaries attached to the ceiling of the ventricle. You have cerebrospinal fluid here. And this cord plexus continuously secrete cerebrospinal fluid inside the ventricle. So, the source of the cerebrospinal fluid is the capillary plexus which is called the choroid plexus okay functions of the cerebrospinal fluid gives bouncy to the central nervous system organs you know <coughs> around the brain in subarachnoid space you have the cerebrospinal fluid not only around the brain also around the spinal cord in subarachnoid space you have cerebrospinal fluid so, around the brain and the spinal cord, you have what? Cerebrospinal fluid, that fluid. Make sense? So, when you move your head suddenly, you know, sometimes we move our head suddenly, right? The fluid around the brain and the spinal cord protect the organs from uh, prevent, by preventing uh, the heating of the brain to the hard bone because you know around the bone you have the hard bone right 
but in between you have the sebus spinal fluid so the brain will not would not hit the heart bone like that the brain is very soft if every time you know sometimes you ride on roller coasters right at six flag you know suddenly your body head moves so your sebus spinal fluid is protecting your brain okay also sebus spinal fluid has some neurotransmitters and nutrients so keep the brain healthy and lively so brain tissue gets nutrition and other chemical signals from the cerebrospinal fluid here you see the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid or flow of the fluid we know that cerebrospinal fluid is in subarachnoid space so this is the subarachnoid space under the arachnoid matter because this is the arachnoid matter so under the arachnoid matter subarachnoid space contains the cerebrospinal fluid around the brain not only that around the spinal cord okay and we know already that cerebrospinal fluid is secreted from the choroid plexus so this is the choroid plexus you see the red one capillary plexus that secretes the cerebrospinal fluid inside the ventricles and from the ventricles the fluid enter enters into the subarachnoid space and circulate okay so continuously the fluid is being secreted by the choroid plexus and the fluid is circulating okay and the cerebrospinal fluid uh, must circulate a new cerebrospinal fluid must be produced parts of the brain the brain has four parts cerebral hemispheres diencephalon brain stem and cerebellum now cerebral hemispheres are formed by uh the cerebral hemispheres we have two cerebral hemispheres hemi means half right you know that hemi means what half so sphere means what A complete circle around so we have two halves that's why for cerebral hemisphere these two together form the sphere that is called the cerebra cerebra so cerebra is the sphere and hemispheres it has two halves then we have diencephalon diencephalon consists of three structures thalamus hypothalamus and the pituitary gland so these three structures together form the diencephalon then brain stem brain stem has three parts midbrain pons and medulla also called medulla oblongata okay so these three structures form the brain stem midbrain pons and medulla oblongata and then we have another part of the brain that is called cerebellum okay now if i show you the brain the most part of the brain that you see is the cerebrum so cerebrum is the largest part of the brain when you see a brain you mostly see the cerebrum so this is the last largest 
part of the brain. Diencephalon is mostly located inside the brain, so you don't see from outside. Brain stem is the part that gets out from the cerebrum and goes downwards. And from the brain stem, spinal cord starts. And cerebellum is in the back. Now, what I will do, I will just mention a couple of functions of these structures. You need to remember those. Now, the outer surface of the cerebrum, if this is the cerebrum of your brain, the outer most layer of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex. Okay. And in the cerebral cortex, you have many functional areas. So, many functional areas are present in the cerebral cortex, which is the outer layer of the cerebrum. Now, what are the functional areas? You have visual area in the back part of the cerebral cortex. You have auditory area that processes the sound under the temporal bone here. Okay? You have motor area that helps in the movement. So, those are the functional areas. Somatosensory areas, pain, touch, temperature, those signals are processed in those areas the sensation of pain, touch, temperature, make sense? So those are the functional areas, visual area, auditory or sound area, your motor area for the movement, your somatosensory, pain, touch, temperature, those areas are located on the surface of the cerebrum. So that is the function, many functional areas are present in the cerebrum. Diencephalon. Diencephalon has three structures, thalamus, hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. Okay? First, I will mention the function of the thalamus. Thalamus is called the major sensory relay station. Very important. Thalamus is called what? The major sensory relay station. That is the function of thalamus. That means almost all sensory signals that travel towards the brain are processed in the thalamus, relayed in the thalamus. Have you seen relay race? Relay race, one person hands the stick to next person, right? So thalamus is the place where one group of neurons gives signal, sensory signal to another set of neurons. That's why it is called the place where relay takes place. Relay of what? Sensory signals. Your touch, pain, temperature, all those are sensory signals going to the brain. <coughs> then hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is, hypo means below the thalamus. So it is located under the thalamus. That's why it is called hypothalamus and hypothalamus has a number of important functions, very important structure of the brain. I'll just mention few of those you must remember. Number one, you already know regulation of body temperature. We have talked about that before, right? Body temperature regulation. When we talked about the skin integumentary system, we have talked about that. Number two. This is interesting. Food and water intake. How much food and water you will intake, that is controlled by your hypothalamus. How? You all know that when you are hungry, you think I will eat a lot, right? If I get the food, I will eat everything. You think that. Then you start to eat, right? And you start to drink. Then, you know, after drinking one or two glass of water, if I ask you to drink more, you will say, no, I won't drink anymore. 
So who is telling you not to drink? Who is inhibiting? That is the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus controls the food and water intake. Will inhibit you from eating further, drinking further, which is good, right? Otherwise you will continue to eat. In a, in, uh, a clinical condition, you know, if hypothalamus function is not, uh, hypothalamic function is disrupted, hypothalamus is not working properly, then the person doesn't know where to stop eating and drinking. You know, so there are some people, they keep eating all day, right? So that could be due to problem in hypothalamus and those people get big, 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 right? Because of eating a lot. So, uh, that is hypothalamus uh, number two. Number three, hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. We know pituitary gland is the master gland, right? But that master gland has a master or boss. That is what hypothalamus. Pituitary controls all the glands, endocrine glands, but pituitary is controlled by the hypothalamus. Make sense? Uh, So those are uh, another one, number four, cardiac and respiratory control, heart and breathing, heart rate and respiratory rate are controlled by the hypothalamus. Okay, then pituitary gland, you all know that pituitary gland is called the master gland at, and it controls the endocrine glands of the body. Then the brain stem part, it consists of the midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. Just know that uh, in the brain stem you have reflex areas. So the reflex functions are controlled by the brain stem, number one. The reflexes are controlled by the brain stem. Number two, brain stem also has important respiratory and cardiac centers. So, respiratory and cardiac centers are located in the brain stem. Uh, so, just know those two important functions. Reflexes are controlled by the brain stem and cardiac and respiratory centers are also located in the brain stem. Cerebellum is the part in the back of the cerebrum and cerebellum is mainly responsible for the balance and equilibrium. So, you know, when you walk or run or stand, your body balance is maintained, right? You don't tilt in one side because your body is being balanced by the cerebellum. Okay? So, maintaining the balance and equilibrium. You know, some people are very good in maintaining balance, right? And if you train the person from childhood, you know, acrobats, Chinese girls are very good, right? They can work on rope because their cerebellum is well developed, more developed than ours. Make sense? Because they get training from their very early stage of life, so the cerebrum, cerebellum uh, develops better. So those are the parts of the brain and their function. You need to know. I can ask a few questions from this part that I have mentioned everything. Here you see those four parts by four different colors. You see the cerebral hemisphere. This is one hemisphere because you are looking one side. There is another hemisphere in the other side. So two hemispheres together form the cerebrum, which is the sphere. And that is the largest part of the brain, you can see here. And then 
you have the diencephalon which consists of the thalamus if you see here carefully if i draw an egg it looks really like a nice egg like this if i complete that egg this is the thalamus and then under the thalamus this part is the hypothalamus hypo means below and this is the pituitary gland okay so those are three parts thalamus hypothalamus pituitary gland then uh, the green colored structure is the brain stem the uppermost part is the midbrain middle part which is wider that is the pons wide and round and then lower part is the medulla oblongata then you see from the medulla oblongata the spinal cord starts okay and in the back and below the hemisphere you have the cerebellum which maintains the balance and equilibrium right so those are the parts of the brain now we'll see the cerebral hemispheres on the surface of the cerebral hemispheres you have many shallow grooves those are called sulci some people say sulci that's also correct okay so singular is sulcus sulcus means one but since you have many you say sulci So sulcus is single one, and sulci many. So we have many sulci on the surface of the hemisphere, and those are shallow groups like this. If you see the surface, this is the surface of the cerebrum, right? Uh, we have many shallow grooves like this so those are the soft shallow grooves okay then we have few deep grooves like this then again shallow okay so these shallow grooves are sulci but deep grooves are called fissures So fissures are deep grooves and sulci are shallow grooves. Okay, we have both, but most of those are shallow grooves or sulci. We have only few deep grooves or fissures. Okay, we'll see uh, those on the surface. You see on the surface you have <coughs> shallow grooves. or sulci now in between two sulci the part or area is called a gyrus so we have many sulci and many gyri so in between two sulci the area is a gyrus and gyrus is again gyrus is single and gyri right is plural more than one okay yeah, more than one so we have many sulci many gyri and also we have deep grooves those are called the fissures here you see one fissure that separates the cerebrum and cerebellum this is called the transverse fissure there is another fissure along the midline that separates two hemispheres it's a deep group here that is called the sagittal because you know that this is the sagittal plane the middle of the head right so in between two hemispheres you have the sagittal fissure also called longitudinal fissure so those are the important fissures one is transverse another is in between two hemispheres You don't see it here because we are putting one hemisphere. So in between two, we 
have the sagittal or longitudinal fissures. <coughs> Here you see longitudinal fissures, fissure separates two hemispheres, a transverse fissure separates cerebrum and cerebellum. Now, each hemisphere consists of five lobes. Each hemisphere or half of the sphere consists of five lobes. Frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital and insula. Now, the location of frontal is easy because under the frontal bone mostly. You know, this is the frontal bone, right? So, frontal lobe is here, temporal lobe is here, parietal lobe is under the parietal bone mostly and occipital lobe is in the back. Make sense? Because this is the occipital bone. Insula is located inside. You don't see the insula from outside. So those are the lobes of the hemisphere. So each hemisphere or half has those five lobes. Here you see by four different colors, they have shown four lobes. The frontal lobe, which is very big. Then behind that, you have the parietal lobe. And behind the parietal, you have the occipital. And below the frontal and parietal, you have the temporal lobe. So those four lobes you can see from outside. Insula is located inside and you can see the insula if you separate the temporal lobe from the lobes above and uh, that part is located inside. Okay. <clears throat> now uh, you remember I told you the function of the cerebrum is on the cerebral hemispheres you have many functional areas like your visual area in the back right sound area auditory area is here I told you touch pain temperature those areas motor area right for movement you have those areas on the surface of the cerebrum so we'll just see few important functional areas and the locations okay you need to remember that first visual visual area is in the back of the occipital lobe you see all the way in the back of the cerebral hemisphere that dark blue color is the primary visual cortex or primary visual area and then let's see the auditory auditory area is in the upper part of the temporal lobe you see in the upper part of the temporal lobe uh, is the primary auditory cortex so the sound signal that goes from the ear is processed there that's why it is called the primary auditory cortex in the upper part of the temporal lobe. Then uh, let us see the primary motor cortex or primary motor area. Motor means movement. So that area controls the movement of the body parts. When we move our body parts, that area sends signal to the muscles. And primary motor cortex is that red colored gyrus and that is called the P central gyrus. Now, this is the primary motor. You see here this red one. And why this gyrus is called P central gyrus? Because this sulcus or glue is called central sulcus. So, P means before, post means after. So, this is P central gyrus, which is primary motor cortex or area. And this is the post central gyrus because it is behind the central sulcus. Okay, so pre central, post central. Pre central is primary motor, post central is primary somatosensory. Primary somatosensory. Now, somatosensory, you can write it down. Somatosensory means what? Pain, touch, temperature. Those signals go from the skin mostly. Pain 
touch temperature and motor is the movement okay so primary motor cortex controls the movement of the body parts and primary somatosensory receives the pain touch temperature signals and process them okay now you see in the back part of the frontal lobe you have an area this one this is the frontal lobe we know that here inside this dotted line this area is called broca's area broca's area this area is responsible for the production of sound speech production when you talk this area controls that the production of speech is controlled by this area so if any you know lesion occurs in this area damage occurs in this area the person will have what difficulty in speaking right producing speech the person will not be able to produce speech or will have difficulty in producing speech make sense and that happens you know stroke if a stroke you know uh, uh, causes lesion in that area then the person cannot produce speech so interesting area broca's is the name of the scientist who neurologist who first mentioned that this area in the frontal lobe is responsible for the production of speech he was a french neurologist and he had a patient many years that patient had problem in uh, speaking producing speech and after the death of his patient he took the brain out okay and studied under the microscope and he found that only that area had a lesion so he first mentioned that since only this area is you know destroyed and that my patient had problem in speech production so he first reported that this area is responsible for that then other you know uh, phys phys physicians they confirmed that later but that's why that area has been named after his name brocas now another area you see is here also inside this dotted line this area is partly in the parietal lobe partly in the temporal lobe and this area is called wernicke's area wernicke's area is responsible for the understanding of speech not production but what understanding two different things remember so when someone is talking you understand what the other person is talking about that is processed in wernicke's area but when you produce speech that is controlled by the broca's area make sense so if wernicke's areas area is destroyed then the person will have no problem in production of his speech make sense because his broca's area is intact so he will be able to speak normally but what will be the problem he won't understand what the other people are saying make sense so that is the wernicke's area uh, now uh, as a whole the frontal area as a whole the frontal lobe is responsible for higher brain functions what are the higher brain functions your intelligence your ability to solve the problems like math problems your emotion judgment those things are controlled by the frontal lobe as a whole intelligence the ability to solve the problems critical thinkings right uh, emotion judgment those things are controlled by the frontal lobe and that's why the frontal lobe in human is much bigger than many other creatures 
because we have those higher order brain functions uh, ability more. Okay. One more thing, why in the surface of the cerebrum you have so many sulci? Any idea? Why? Like this. To increase the surface area. Make sense? Like if I, you know, um, in your house, you have the curtain, uh, curtain in the window, right? Window curtain. And you can fold like this and make it small, right? And sometimes you can spread it, make it big. So, exactly same thing is here. You are folding the surface, right? Like this. Now, if you make all those folding straight, it will be big area, right? So, on the surface of the brain, you have actually huge area, big area. But since you have those foldings, right, uh, in a small brain, you can accommodate that big surface. And you know that surface has so many functional areas. So, so many functions are being processed. So, you need big area and many neurons there. Okay, so those are some functional areas. <clears throat> now, we can divide all those functional areas that I have mentioned few of those into three types. Motor areas, sensory areas and association areas. Motor areas, you know that the motor functions like movement is controlled by motor area. You have already seen primary motor cortex. I have shown you precentral gyrus. This red one is the primary motor cortex. So this area is a motor area. Also, know that the Broca's area is a motor area because why it is motor area? Your Broca's area is sending signal to the vocal cords. And you know that by controlling the vocal cords, we control the speech, right? because vocal cord is responsible for the production of sound. So, that is also a motor area. So, those are motor areas. Primary motor cortex for the movement of the body parts, Broca's area for the movement of the vocal cord. Now, sensory areas, your visual area, your auditory area, your som primary somatosensory area, those areas are sensory areas. Remember, sensory signal goes from outside towards the brain, right? You know that sensory towards the brain, motor away from the brain. So, from the eye, the visual signal goes towards the brain, so that is sensory, make sense? From the ear, sound signal goes to the brain, so sensory, pain, touch, temperature from the skin, right? Go to the brain, so all those are sensory. Now, you got motor areas, sensory areas. Now, the question is, what are the association areas? You also have some areas. Those areas combine two or more functions together. That's why those are called association areas. They combine two or more functions. Let me give you an example. When you are listening my lecture, the sound signal is going from the ear to the brain, right? Which part of the brain? Auditory cortex. You remember the auditory cortex here is receiving that signal. Now, at the same time, what are you doing? You are seeing, right? Looking at me. So, that is what? Visual signal going from the eye to the brain. But you know already that your visual area is in the back of the cerebrum, right? And the auditory is here, right? So your sound is being processed here and sight is being processed here. Make sense? They are far from each other. So, but those two things, things must be combined. So we have the area where those two auditory sound and sight visual 
are combined. So that's the audio visual association areas. Make sense? Audio, sound, visual, sight. Now, why you need that? Just think simple. When you are listening my lecture, at the same time you are looking at me, right? So you see that I am talking. Now, if sound goes from me, comes out from my mouth, but if you see my mouth is not moving, what will happen? You will get confused, right? So those two things must be combined to make sense. If you hear the sound from this skeleton and see I am moving my mouth, but sound is getting out from that, you will get confused, right? So your sight and audition must be combined to make sense. Make sense? So those are the association areas where uh, two or more functions are integrated or combined or put together. White matter, gray matter. I have talked about this before in last class. Inside the central nervous system, that means inside the brain and the spinal cord, you will see some areas are white, some areas are gray. So you have gray matter and white matter. Now, if you cut the cerebrum, see the first picture, cut the cerebrum, you see the outer layer, which is the cortex, is the gray matter. So the outer layer, which is the cortex, you know that. So this cortex is called gray matter. Why? And inner part is white matter. Okay. So now, here it is. So outer part is the gray matter, inner part is the white matter. Why is that? I have mentioned in last class. In this area, you have the cell bodies of neurons. So all cell bodies of neurons are here and the dendrites. You know, dendrites are short branching process. And inside the cell bodies, you have missile granules. Missile granules inside the cell body of the neurons. We have talked about that in last class. And in the inner part, you have the axons, all the axons. And you know that axons are covered by white myelin sheath. So these axons are covered by what? Myelin sheath, white covering. So this part looks white because all the myelinated axon fibers are in this part. So that's why this looks white. And because of the nasal granules in the cell body, this part look, looks gray. So in the gray matter, you have the cell bodies and dendrites. In the white matter, you have myelinated fibers. Okay, you need to know that. If you cut the brain stem and the spinal cord, the inner part is gray matter and the outer part is white matter. So it's kind of opposite of the cerebrum. You see in the cerebrum, the outer layer is the gray matter which is called the cortex, okay? and the inner part is the white matter. Looks like a piece of cake, right? The cream part is the gray matter or cortex. <coughs> okay, this is the medial view of the cerebral hemisphere. So if you take one half and see the medial side, the other pictures you have seen before, the lateral side. Now if you see the medial side, you have few structures. You see the white C-shaped band that is called the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the structure that attaches two hemispheres together. So this is a very important structure that holds the two hemispheres 
together and through the corpus callosum the fibers go from one side of the brain to other that means from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere the fibers are passing through the corpus callosum so this is very important because your two hemispheres must talk to each other make sense they cannot do work separately they must talk to each other so the fibers from right going to the left like this fibers from left going to the right through the, like this right so in the corpus callosum you have fibers going in both directions make sense from right to left from left to right like this this is the corpus callosum and you know already that how many hemispheres you have two right so you have two visual areas two visual areas make sense you have two auditory areas they need to talk to each other right so that's why the corpus callosum is very important not only it holds the hemispheres together through it the fibers from right to left left to right uh pass okay common coli common coli is plural because we have two moral and two sensory common coli to motor and to sensory homunculi homunculi is plural homunculus is singular one okay since we have more than one that's why we say homunculi now what are the homunculi homunculi are your entire body map in the primary motor cortex primary motor you already know that cortex the central gyrus you remember and you have map in somatosensory cortex so you have the entire body map both in primary motor cortex and in primary somatosensory cortex what map i have already mentioned which map entire body map entire body map right in these structures so those body maps the entire body maps are called homunculi so where you have those body maps in the primary motor cortex in the primary somatosensory cortex make sense now let's see you must remember that let's go back to, to the place where i showed you primary motor cortex and primary somatosensory cortex you must remember that you see here this is the primary motor cortex right the central gyrus you have your whole body map here and this is primary somatosensory cortex you have whole body map here so this is one hemisphere you have one motor homunculus one sensory homunculus in the other hemisphere you have same thing one motor homunculus one sensory homunculus makes sense so you have the whole body map now let's see how the body map looks like this is very interesting this is a coronal section like this so you see the slice like this you see here slice like this through the 
sensory, somatoprimary somatosensory cortex. So now you see how your body areas are represented, presented in the primary somatosensory cortex because this is sensory homunculi. So you see your head part is presented in a bigger area, larger area. Your hand part is in a bigger area of the somatosensory cortex. But interestingly, you see your leg and trunk is presented in smaller area. So the map, enter body map is there, but that body map is disproportionate to your body. Make sense? Not proportionate to your body. Because head, your hand is presented in big area. Make sense? Your trunk is big, although trunk is big, but it is presented in the brain in a smaller area. Why this map is disproportionate map? Because we say that this map is use dependent map. Which areas you use more? You, your brain needs bigger presentation for that area because your brain needs more neurons. For example, you move your hands a lot, right? You touch, you feel the things using your hands, right? Fingers. So somatosensory signals are all the time going to the brain from the fingers, right? So you need more neurons, more area. More area, bigger area means more neurons. Make sense? You have more neurons there. So you need more neurons, that means bigger area for the hands. For the face, you need bigger area. For the trunk, you don't need that big area. So now I'm mentioning the definition of the homunculus is, it is a disproportionate map. What map? Body map. Make sense? Disproportionate body map in the primary motor or primary somatosensory cortex. You see here, similarly, in the primary motor cortex, you have the whole body map and hand area is big because we move the fingers a lot, we move the hand a lot, right? To, you know, if you play piano, you use the fingers a lot, right? Even not, you to grab something, you always use the fingers and hands. So, the area is bigger in the brain, motor movement. Make sense? Not only touch, touch is some sensory movement. Right? Both are uh, bigger in the brain. Now, uh, you know, it is interesting that this map can be changed. This map can be changed. You know, those people play piano, like 30 years, 40 years, right? From childhood, they are playing piano every day. So, they move the fingers a lot, right? So that area in their brain is even bigger than normal people. But there are some studies, research that they have found that, right? So use dependent. If you use that area more, that area expands. If you don't use, that area shrinks. Make sense? Use dependent. And I did uh, uh, research on this topic few years in Canada, as, uh, it was like 10 years ago. We used raccoons, you know raccoons? They use the fingers to eat or peel the things, these fingers. So these fingers in their brain is pretty, finger area, pretty big. Okay, then what uh, I did, don't be scared, okay? So surgically, we amputated the nerve, dissected the nerve here, okay? From this. So, no signal is going from the finger to the brain. Make sense? So after a few weeks, uh, when we have measured the size of that area in the brain, we have found that it got shrunk, but it's smaller because signal is not going from there to there. Okay? So this is very, you know, strong uh, dynamic map that can be changed if signal is not going or that area is not being used. Make sense? Uh, shrink a lot. Okay. 
So yeah, that's uh, all for today. If you have any questions?